This episode is part of Lanfrica Talks. Lanfrica Talks provides a platform to showcase efforts in language technologies around the world. To learn more or attend our live sessions, see the description below. Good day, everyone, and welcome again to another exciting episode of the Lamb Fricka Talks. I am Chris, your moderator, and for those who are new to this show, the Lamb Fricka Talks is a place to discover inspiring stories like the one we're going to hear today, discover pioneering projects, research businesses, and much more. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channels for more exciting talk shows. Today, we host... Graham Morrissey. Graham Morrissey is the Chief Operating Officer at Way With Words, a global provider of speech-to-text services and solutions dedicated to addressing the discrepancy between data scarcity and the potential presented by incorporating African languages into emerging technologies. I am very, very happy to have you, Graham, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to represent Way With Words. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity and a big fan of Landfrica Records, Landfrica Talks. And um, thank you again. Yeah, yeah, really glad to be kicking off and um, having this time with you and um, the community to chat about the topic at hand, which uh, we've set as the value of community in data set creation. And that's a really important word that will uh, come up throughout the talk today. Uh, just to sort of frame the discussion before we get started, you know, it's um, a time right now, I'm sure we can all appreciate rapid technological advancement. It seems, you know, every other week there's a breakthrough that um, represents an exponential jump in what was before possible rather than incremental. And in the age of large language models, I think, you know, there's so many opportunities, but also so many challenges. And perhaps the biggest challenge, despite popular fear mongering around whether AI will take all of our jobs one day in the future is um, more the way in which people are shaping technology rather than how technology is impacting people. I think that there, there needs to be some strong consideration there. And um, how do we ensure that we create, deploy and use technology in a way that best serves all end users and not just a select few. So it's a bit of a story on our involvement, um, you know, in the landscape that has come uh, into creation over the last uh, while with regard to, you know, technologies, language, and how those merge, and uh, looking forward to getting into it. So I think to get started, uh, I'll provide a brief introduction uh, to Way With Words. So Way With Words has been around for 20 plus years, and I've been with the company for the past eight years. We have very humble origins as a, a business process outsourcing unit that started in Cape Town to service clients in London. And we actually had guys riding around on little motorbikes delivering cassette tapes, if uh, any of you out there can remember those, and, you know, dedicated transcribers using foot pedals and um, the equipment that was out at the time to produce reams and reams of documents that we, you know, sent across the pond, if you will, to clients that uh, needed them for, you know, legal services primarily. And over the years, Way With Words has grown more into a global language service provider, uh, mainly focused on transcription, captioning, and um, particularly in the last four to five years, activities supporting the development of technology. So, you know, um, large volumes of uh, machine transcription polishing to improve automated speech recognition, uh, speech collection and annotation services, and um, you know, other tasks such as um, large language model prompt completion tasks and um, anything else really where um, the project management of people comes into play. So it's a, a really interesting time in the language service space uh, with rapid adoption of technology. And um, primarily as a, a human transcription provider, we have our niche in the market and, and our space. But um, it's a very interesting time for sure as um, automation improves efficiencies and brings costs down. So um, a lot to think about there for us. And, and and that's the journey we're on at the moment. But very exciting for us as a business to be involved in the project side of um, where everything's headed. And, um, you know, we, we're quite thoughtful and conscious of 
um, the role we play there and the role we might be able to play forward with a particular focus on on South Africa and and, and in Africa as well. Just for the listeners out there, um, you know, Where With Words is a South African and a United Kingdom registered company. We're also a, a Australian registered company, but um, a lot of this talk will be focused on our efforts in a local context, local to South Africa, and, you know, our, our thought process around how this might apply to African languages as well. So for context sake, um, quite a bit of the discussion will be around um, opportunities and challenges that exist currently in South Africa. So to focus the talk, I'd like to frame the question of what can be achieved um, considering developed systems of language technologies. And um, AI can do a lot of things for, for, for many people, but what about those that currently don't reap its benefits? Um, I mean, it's very impressive to think that we're nearing human levels of intelligence or human-like levels of intelligence and reasoning, thinking, um, you know, assisting us with tasks. But to be honest, that is really only true for a handful of languages and um, possibly even one to three. Um, so the question is, what can be achieved if that level of access is is spread across the board and um, made available to, to those who need it and uh, those who currently don't have it? So... You know, when you think about Africa, it's probably got about a third of the world's linguistic diversity and um, a lot of languages. If the world has around 7,000 languages, you know, Africa is said to have about 2,000 of those, if not more. And um, with that in mind, there's a ton of work to be done if we're going to address, um, you know, digital equity and, and broach those questions of what about, you know, the rest of the globe when it comes to established technologies and all the benefits that come with those. Um, definitely a long way to go, but I think that's exactly why plat platforms like yours exist, and um, that's what we'd like to talk about today. So if we think about some of the things that can be achieved if we had some parity uh, in terms of inclusion of digital technologies and access thereof, one of the first things that comes to mind is education. Of course, um, in a context like South Africa, we've got... Um, a great disparity between, you know, the the access to education that's available um, for those within the country. I mean, it's it's a worldwide uh, scenario where it's it's not equal, and um, there is a lot of information available and a lot of services and access when it comes to English and the the dominant languages out there that are accounted for in terms of you know technological development. But certainly, in a local sense, there's a lot that can be done if we can get to a place where um, language is represented in a digital sense uh, in the multitude of languages we do have here. So things like literacy rates, um, educational outcomes, and and language barriers in schools can be addressed if, if that's one of the areas that's targeted when it comes to technological development uh, with a focus on language particularly. Healthcare is another big one. Um, just... I imagine that there's a lot of people out there that struggle just to get to a clinic um, if they may be in an area that's remote and, um, you know, hard for them to do things. And if they do have some kind of mobile phone or technology at home, it might be a lot easier um, not having to travel and being able to use technology to to get a diagnosis, to, to speak to a practitioner or even to a chatbot and have some kind of... Um, tools to enable them to to benefit from what others can do within the same space um, in the more sort of represented represented part of the world I suppose another area that um, could profit from improved access to to technology and and, and digital solutions would be business and e-commerce if you think about it I think um, there's probably a lot of people within South Africa that still travel to the bank physically to do transactions, to check on the status of their account. Um, I'm sure that if there were access within their, their you know, first language to do these types of things, they could engage with their banking application and get things done without having to travel distances to get to a bank and then still speak in English to a, um, you know, a, a person at the bank. And it's not just about being able to uh, engage uh, in your own language and um, 
have that as as an opportunity. It's also good business uh, if you know institutions, organizations, companies out there are able to speak to their customers in their mother tongue, in their their native language. It's actually good business. It's not just a question of you know ethics, inclusivity, and and what's right. It's it's also a good business practice and and something that you know can be pushed as as an agenda that maybe makes sense um, on another level uh, in a wider respect. And then social inclusion, you know, digital equality is 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 there um, to support active participation in civic life and access to digital services that you know can can help a country to run more smoothly and um, so forth. So there's there's a lot of things that can be achieved. These are just four broad areas I've mentioned, um, but there's a ton of other you know uh, economic areas and um, areas for development that can benefit from uh, technological development you know agriculture and rural development economic growth and, and and job creation legal access justice disaster response and safety uh, not to mention preservation of of cultural heritage and um, linguistic diversity and then you know things like media and entertainment to be able to engage with um, with things that most people take for granted in English, in other languages. And I know that's that's very far down the line. There's much more important things to address before that. But just to touch on some of the things that can be done if we have a much better and more inclusive landscape when it comes to digital technologies and particularly with the focus on language technologies. So to get more into uh, the talk at hand, which is to do with the value of community and particular, particularly the value of community within data set creation, and now this is our experience as way with words as a small company that's uh, been doing this for a select uh, group of clients. It's It's been our experience that, you know, there's this confluence of interest, this confluence of expertise and this growing landscape that is ripe and fertile perhaps and to move forward the digital agenda, but it's just lacking a bit of direction and focus perhaps. And, um, I really want to preface all the rest of what I say, um, you know, by saying that I'm not an expert when it comes to um, to coding, to natural language processing, to um, any of the languages in which your esteemed colleagues and and most of the viewers, you know, would be um, au fait with. So we really have that experience of creating data for the end use, which is you know modeling algorithms and and creating um, new or improved speech recognition systems. So this is more um, a comment from our experience on, on what we've seen, um, the practices we've used to create the data sets um, we have and uh, possibly a view forward. So I don't claim to be an expert. And I also will say at this point that I don't have the answers to some of the questions I'll pose, but I hope that's a good thing. And I hope that allows for, um, you know, conversation and discussion that can I hope in a humble way get us you know to a space that's that's better so with that in mind uh, within the space of AI um, machine learning natural language processing and towards everyday applications of technology let's think of these groups of burgeoning communities that I've so far um, delineated by passion and profit let's define these groups roughly as data practitioners. So if we go with the category of passion, um, some of the communities that are you know notable and I would say commendable and 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 that we need to discuss now, or I'd like to discuss now, you have um, awesome groups like Masakane, which is a, a grassroots organization focused on um, expanding uh, you know the benefits of, of of a natural language processing community for for social good for real problems you've got Landfrica records and Landfrica talks you know spreading um, the community spreading expertise discussing you know where to find resources making those resources available and um, all within one space that's hugely hugely helpful and beneficial beneficial to a community of data practitioners. Um, you've got Mozilla's Common Voice, which is the, the Common Voice project. I think to date they have around um, 
28,000 validate uh, 28,000 recorded hours across a multitude of languages. That's all uh, recorded on a voluntary basis, all validated on a voluntary basis, and um, available open source for uh, the development and and sharing of of models that can be um, reused and repurposed. And these are fantastic resources, organizations, you know, doing things for social good. And um, I really see these these communities and um, have a great deal of respect for them. And I think they need to be commended because it's this fire in the bellies of those that are members um, of the communities that, that really will move things forward. So big shout out to yourself, Chris, big shout out to all of the people that are involved in these communities where, um, you know, I see it as primarily people with the skills needed to move things forward, but with without necessarily the data, they, they might always need to do that. Um, there are others within this category of passion. So I would include data scientists, researchers, academics, and um, there's a number of um, areas in which uh, these individuals or communities fall in the broader landscape that I'm trying to sort of uh, paint a picture of here. And I would think that that, that includes um, some public organizations. Here in South Africa, we've got a group called Sadala, which you know, they're the custodians of, of digital language um, resources. So most of the time, those are sponsored by government and then kept in an online repository and are available under Creative Common licenses for academics and, and researchers and data scientists to use in, in their endeavors to create new models and um, break ground with um, technology and, and ways of, of, of using data to create new technologies. So I would put that... Um, within the, the the broad category of passion because um, it's not necessarily for profit. And I think there are, you know, other groups in there, if I've forgot to include some, perhaps later on we can um, we can we can discuss who I might have missed out. Uh, there's also Lacuna Fund and 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 other organizations that strive to create impact through uh, through funding these groups of passionate communities that are moving uh, language technology forward and just to sum it up you know it, it, it these these individuals these organizations this call to action um of a, of a community of passion i would say is is broadly defined as striving for social good altruistic and um working towards a public interest then on the other hand we've got the the group of communities that broadly fall within the remit of profit um, would typically your large corporates, uh, venture capital, investment, tech platforms, consultancies. I have to include way with words here. You know, we, we are a small business. And um, as I said, humble origins, you know, secretarial in nature, transcription, grown into captioning and related services uh, from speech to text services and solutions now into digital language um, service areas. And um we found ourselves um, having exposure to this service area we call speech collection uh, and data set creation. And it's led us to this point, you know, where we feel we have something to contribute and um, we want to continue doing that. So it's not inherently bad that there's a group of um, communities that is able to contribute to uh, the broader goal of inclusivity within language technology it's it's not a bad thing i mean when i think of way with words we've we've worked with hundreds of people in the last year let alone 20 years providing um, contractual opportunities uh, which broaden professional development offer financial incentives to participants and um and 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 those that take on the the projects and jobs that we have available I think of another uh, technology platform like Zindi, which has more than 70,000 uh, data scientists across Africa. You know, most of the time they're solving corporate needs or corporate problems, but it's also for social good. A lot of these, um, uh, uh, Zindi as a platform hosts competitions where uh, there's a problem that needs solving. Some of the time it's for a, a, a corporate, so they'll have an internal 
a problem for which they need a solution and they can post that on the Zindi platform. And then from the group of data scientists that are registered there, you know, the community can get to work to solving these problems, be um, rewarded through uh, financial um, a prize for placing in you know one of the top three spots for the work they've created and um that's a fantastic community as well where you know there's there's a lot of good going on and um it's connecting a lot of individuals that you know have that that goal of improving their craft uh, improving their skills and and also being out there addressing real world issues so there's it there's a group of different communities at play here that aren't always working towards the same goal. Sometimes they are um, all good and well, but there doesn't seem to be a common thread that, that can hold everything together. And that's something I want to start getting at in, in today's talk, you know, maybe this disconnect between public and private, that space in the middle where how can everybody come together and, um, you know, look at that issue of public versus private when it comes to, to data, when it comes to purpose, when it comes to vision and um, what the future looks like for language technologies and, and, and the people it serves. Now, to detail a little bit of our experience in data collection, it's been a really great journey and... Um, We've enjoyed it again from 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 humble origins. We weren't really uh, equipped to deal with the first opportunity that came our way as a, a transcription company working with people. Uh, we received a contact form to say, can you support this data collection effort? And um, we're looking for South African English. We're looking for South African Afrikaans. And um, here's the specifications. We'd seen a ton of... Um, requests for quotation and um, expressions of interest with regard to recording um, speech samples and annotating the same for a range of languages but this was the first time something came in that that was local to us or um, made sense for us to work on and I remember in the beginning we you know sent some samples through to the client and it was just basic MS Word documents um, our timestamps didn't really align perfectly to the recordings we we'd um, we'd undertaken, and luckily the client was very technologically sophisticated, and were able to retime everything and make it work on their end. But from that time, um, you know, we got a lot of uh, experience and 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 improved to the point where we've got our own workflows and so forth to handle these these types of things. But um, first. Off when we worked on these um, projects, we were obviously creating um, proprietary data sets for clients that wanted to either create new um, speech recognition models or improve speech recognition models within a certain uh, domain of knowledge or language. So when we look at this proprietary data and uh, the type of work we did for the first two years in, in getting used to this um, service area, we we created very customer specific data sets so we would be informed at the start of the project it needs to cover the the, the following domains whether it be retail uh, banking travel insurance uh, finance um, you know any of those those domains um obviously the work that we created was for a client and um not relicensable and um it's gone forever once we created it. Uh, it's not available to serve anybody else, to um, have any benefit other than for the client that commissioned it, which is fair enough. I mean, when you look at the uh, other option when it comes to data, you, you could go for an off-the-shelf data set, which is something that's a lot more standard and convention and not applicable to one immediate client need. And um, the benefit of this type of data is it's, it's licensable. Um, it can be, you know, reused and repurposed and um, made to be customizable. So the difference there really is just, you know, that that element of competition, I suppose, where in creating proprietary data, um, a client can get a, a competitive advantage where they have access to something someone else doesn't have. Whereas with off the shelf data, it's, it's you know, a bit more affordable and um, able to be used in different ways and, 
you know, OTS data or off the shelf data is perhaps not the best moniker in this scenario because um, what we'd like to talk about is the difference in availability of data sets. And um, I just thought I'd mention at that at this point, you know, the experience we've had from working on a range of different languages, a range of different projects, all for one client versus last year when we decided given our position within South Africa and Africa and um, our strategic viewpoint going forward, we'd had a lot of interest also in, in South African languages, particularly South African English and Afrikaans. And we'd seen that coming through in the work we were doing for machine transcription polishing. So all of a sudden call centers in, in North America are now sending us data to polish and, and, improve upon so that it can go back into the modeling and um, become more accurate. And we were thinking, okay, you know, people are starting to become interested in, in South African uh, variances of English in languages local to South Africa. And since that time, about three years ago, it's becoming more and more evident that languages here, local to us in South Africa, languages in Africa, there's slowly but surely much more of a demand um, for solutions uh, that speak to the need uh, on the continent. And um, yeah, it's it, it's an area that we'd like to move forward in for sure because it matches our expertise and, and also it matches our vision to be a company that is, is supportive of the people out there that um, have the skills and talents to, to be doing good work, but, you know, might not necessarily have that availability to them, especially when it comes to language services, transcription, you know, we've got our small space to work in and, um, and, and for us, that's important and, and something that we'd like to expand upon. So just in discussing some of the, the work we've done up to now, um, whether it be, you know, proprietary data, off the shelf data, um, any of those, there are some considerations when it comes to data collection, and um, I'll speak a bit on those now. Uh, the first one would be data governance. It's really important that when you embark on a, a collection project to be very specific about the usage of the data you're collecting. So you need to contract with the participants and safeguard and anonymize their information. And it's it's always the case that you want to make sure the data set is free from bias. It's fully representative of um, a broad range of participants across the, the you know, to represent the linguistic uh, and demographic diversity um, for the language that you're dealing with. So all of those elements are super important in, in a um, data collection project. Community is probably the one thing that we found out later on um, was the key to unlock everything. Um, you know, we, we've, we've done a ton of these projects and they've ranged from uh, being on time to being um, delayed to all kinds of challenges uh, representative of so socioeconomic issues, technological hurdles, um, challenges due to linguistic diversity. And the more we undertook these these projects, the more we realized um, how to put things in place that that made them run more smoothly. And the key to to it all really is community. I mean, when you have a group of participants that have a clear contract uh, regarding the usage of of the data they produce, you know, where it's going, what it'll be used for, what it won't be used for, uh, a commitment from the participant, a commitment from the company, and um, from there, a clear understanding of what the benefit of the data will be. If you can provide that, that's great, um, so that they understand why they're, they're completing the tasks that um, they, they have in front of them. It's really important that um, when you're working in different languages, you are creating instructional material that's in a first language for the participants. It's not an easy task to create spontaneous um, simulated conversations um, for two people that have never met each other. So if I had to say to person A, you are an agent and person B, you are a caller and you need to role play um, a scenario where 
one person is um, an upset customer that needs to explain why their product needs to be returned and the other person is the agent explaining the policy of the company it sounds simple enough but you know if that isn't broken down into a language that resonates with the participant if it's not clear you know, how it needs to be done and um, if all of those steps aren't in place and you're not recruiting to have a full range of um, diversity when you when you undertake these these projects that they're not going to be of much use going on and uh, what we found was uh, doing um, you know group meetings and um, being accountable to the participants of our projects getting to know them um, going on video calls with you know massive groups of people and um, letting them start to feel comfortable with each other and the process as soon as we started to do things like that uh, you know as irrelevant as it might sound in the beginning you need to recruit x number of people you need to get these people to do certain tasks and then you need to collate all the information make sure you have rich metadata de-anonymize that data from all of the participants and then send it off to the client it, it sounds simple but if you don't have that um that bond of community or that common goal or that common understanding it's a lot harder to get these projects done and it was just amazing to us how once we fostered that sense of um you know communal engagement and interaction it was a lot easier for people to start engaging uh, creating data and enjoying it and often at the end of these projects it was quite amazing to us you know through the course of the project we we'd have um different channels of communication where we would get to know the participants, they'd get to know each other. They would begin to talk about um, different topics of interest that, you know, we'd post each day and come the end of a collection um, we'd have participants almost sad. Um, actually many times saying that they were sad it was over, um, you know, due to the enjoyment they derived from being part of a group of people that had a common goal and enjoyed uh, contributing towards it. So that for us was a, a fascinating experience and, and revelation that the more we brought the people together and, 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 you know, made, made a common goal out of everything, um, the more it moved forward. So that was really important. And, and in a way that's meaningful, I'd like to reflect back onto that, that, dichotomy of public versus private and um retained and um and 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 non-licensable non-shareable versus uh, out there open source available for research available to share there's that divide where there isn't sort of a middle ground that's easily discernible and and i'd like to if we can somehow um unpack that as we move forward so other um considerations we have to think about when it comes to to data collection and um, with reference to our experience in in the process is what is the motivation of the participants for any given data collection project you know um, for for a, for a particular language for a particular domain and um, you've got these two things again pointing back to broadly speaking public or social good versus private and um, and closed off restricted you've got the altruistic um, purpose which can encapsulate a lot of different um, root um, motivations so you've got uh, individuals wanting to improve their professional network to improve their um, um, professional abilities you've got uh, those that want to see their language their culture um, a sense of who they are preserved and retained uh, you've got all of the good groups I mentioned before uh, falling into that altruistic category. And then you've got incentivization. And, and that's not always the same thing. It's not always as black and white as money. As it's, It can be different things. I mean, when it comes to collecting data in a um, first world country in the likes of, of, of Scandinavian countries where there's a, a phenomenal quality of life and um you know a very a very decent median um, um remuneration across the the board for 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 a country where people you know um get paid well um live well how do you collect data there where um a person doesn't necessarily have as much 
of a financial um, incentive to participate in a project like data collection. We found that if you donate to a charitable cause that that matches the interests of the participant, you can get them to join the community and and willingly participate because for them, the incentive is that they're contributing to good. Um, if they're not particularly interested in in preserving their language or culture because perhaps it's already fairly well um, documented, perhaps there are language technologies that already allow for that preservation and 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 that positioning within you know the people of that country's daily life. Well, then sometimes donating to a charitable cause works. Um, you know, you could have other things like. Um, um, vouchers or actual products that are sent to participants but at the end of the day of course particularly in a country like South Africa where uh, employment and, and contractual work opportunities can be hard to come by um, a financial incentive is a perfectly reasonable um, way of attracting participants to to do these type of data collection projects so just all of this to say um, when embarking on a on a data collection project, you know there's some considerations that that cannot be ignored, and and as discussed, those would be data governance and ethics, um, the key to unlocking productivity, the key to moving things forward, because a lot of these efforts fall short in the beginning or halfway through, and don't materialize because there needs to be that that constant, you know, um, element of passion that is present in the process of uh, the data collection project and and for that you know to to be the case we've definitely found that community is key so moving forward if we look at some opportunities and, and challenges that exist um, for data collection for uh, digital language technologies in in africa the opportunities are um, to leverage on uh, the 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 need and the goal of uh, preserving linguistic diversity and you know language is more than just a means of communication it, it speaks to people's culture um, it has to do with you know their history and their family and um, I think it's a very strong um, reason and cause for us to to include in uh, the focus of uh, broadening language technology going forward Inclusive digital services. Um, I mentioned some of this before, where a person might not uh, be able to travel easily to a hospital, uh, a clinic, and if they were able to use digital services to get a diagnosis, or not necessarily a diagnosis, just you know, advice from a medical practitioner. I think it would be um, a huge upgrade on on what might be the current scenario at present. And um, global collaboration, at the moment. There, there's not much um, ability when it comes to, you know, the 2000 languages within Africa, uh, insofar as it's possible to engage digitally with those languages. So a lot of work still needs to be done. And uh, if a common thread can be found, and if there's a way in which we can move forward across uh, a lot of the languages that are at the moment underrepresented, it's, there's a huge potential for uh, global collaboration and and to move forward with those languages on a much broader scale than is currently uh, possible rather sorry some of the challenges that exist data scarcity i would love to hear from you chris and, and your colleagues you know what might be your go-to uh, resource center if not landfrica records when looking to work on um, your nlp skills on on you know, working on modeling and new methods of, of working with data. I think some of the most commonly available resources would include um, uh, Bible texts, Bible translations, um, government documentation, although these aren't representative of um, natural language per se, so I don't know how far they can take one when it comes to creating um applications that speak to real world problems particularly you know where natural language is um different from from the sources i just quoted now so data scarcity is definitely something that hinders any community whether it be um, you know born out of passion or um you know out of profit uh, there's 
there's definitely no scarcity when it comes to solving a corporate problem insofar as um, if you want to create some process, uh, automate it, that speaks to a business need, they, the business could simply take their existing data. You know, one would hope there's um, safeguards in place to um, secure the uh, identity and personal information uh, that may be included in such data. But there's not a lack of data scarcity there. There's just a lack of skills and know-how potentially where um, uh, an ethical AI program needs to be introduced into the company. And, and then they look at it from that perspective. But um, in the broad scheme of things, I'd love to know how, you know, um, groups like Masakane, for example, uh, get the data that they need when they're not creating it themselves, because uh, that seems to me a very painstaking process where uh, the individual is probably better suited to actually applying their data science capabilities than going and scraping for information and, and doing that painstaking scouring of YouTube uh, or Google or whatever it may be to track down data that can be useful for um, the end purpose. Uh, another challenge that exists is, is limited resources. Where are the resources drawn from? Is it public? Is it private? How far can that budget go? What can it sustain? Um, what's the life cycle of that endeavor and, and where does it um, taper off? So it speaks to uh, the issue of sustainability as well. There are some good initiatives in play at the moment. Um, some of them take time to complete and then they're available. And 10 years later, they're still there. Um, other initiatives start and never end. So yeah, they, they, there's a number of challenges that, that are um, present at the moment that, that we can consider. And then for some considerations to kind of wrap up um, the direction of the talk uh, around advocacy and awareness, how could we possibly um, discern a common thread between public, between private to have some kind of sustainable push to address real world problems, whether it be in healthcare, whether it be in education, uh, whether it be in agriculture, if we can define those problems that are most pressing, how can we prioritize which language needs to, um, you know, have 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 a model created first that can that can prove value and then convince stakeholders at a broader level to become engaged and replicate that process across languages that might be slightly lower priority. I mean, every language, every person ought to be the priority, but if there's a certain language uh, within a language group uh, that has a high number of speakers and from which other models can be more easily adapted, you know, that process of prioritization um, following successful advocacy and awareness, one could hope would lead to, to long-term commitment. So to sum it up, uh, there are a number of communities at the moment in the landscape with regard to language technologies. Uh, some of them are in the corporate space where, you know, profit is the primary motivator at the end of the day, but there are a number of companies and groups that are able to, you know, straddle both sides of the equation. They can create data that solves problems for them as a corporation, but they can also then create and share that data for, for social good. Then you have the communities of passion that are moving things forward at a grassroots level and constantly innovating and advocating. And, and those for me are, are fantastic and, um, uh, you know, doing great work in in um, emphasizing how much more work needs to be done and, you know, the torchbearers of um, actual progress. And then we've got that space in the middle. How do we how do we integrate the two? How do we provide data scientists, academics, researchers, um, grassroots organizations with data that helps with, you know, the work that they are undertaking? How do we solve real problems and and make a sustainable push to put in place programs whereby language inclusivity is a priority and and can be delivered, you know, to the benefit of all? So I hope that's made sense. I hope um, our humble experience within the world of data collection, um, you know, has a space within Landfrica Talks and. Um, uh, from there, perhaps, you know, there's some questions we can we can put on the table and um, move towards a, a landscape that paints a fuller picture representative of a broader range of interests. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Graham, for this. Um, this was truly, truly heartfelt presentation. I am deeply, deeply touched. Thank you so much. You're um, welcome. You're to say so. Um, okay, so let's go a bit into the present, uh, into the, the next round of discussion.